IB Nation, welcome back to the Irish Breakdown Podcast live here on a Friday, which of course means that we are here for Notre Dame Recruiting Hour, but I have here with me a special guest. You guys should recognize him. Max Torres has been on the show before. He is the publisher over at Ducks Digest on Fan Nation, a part of the Sports Illustrated family, obviously. Uh, Max, what was the name of your podcast as well? I want uh, to make sure to plug that in the beginning before we get going here. I appreciate that. It's the Ducks Dish Podcast. Ducks Dish Podcast. So Max has been with us before, folks. I think you remember him. We talked a lot about some Notre Dame, Oregon targets in the 2024 class. Uh, obviously, that was probably almost a year ago at this point. Like it was, it was a while ago now. But now we're turning the page to 2025 because there is a couple targets on the board that have interest in both Notre Dame and Oregon. We'll also talk about a couple 2026 quarterbacks because if you haven't noticed, Notre Dame has has Offered seven quarterbacks now, but three of them are in the state of California. So they're targeting some West Coast guys there. Also taking a look at some wide receivers like Daniel Odom, Madden Williams. We'll talk about a few of those early 2026 names. But also, we're going to start the conversation today about the early signing day periods getting shuffled a little bit. At least the early signing day, the actual early signing days. And we'll kind of we're going to kind of take it in from a Notre Dame and Oregon lens, but also just kind of full landscape lens, right? Because obviously we cover I cover Notre Dame, Max covers Oregon, so he's got that natural lens of like how it affects the University of Oregon for him. But I want to talk about it from an all encompassing. What does this mean for college football? Because it is a thing that has already been kind of pushed through, and also there's a potential change for 2025 as far as a actual early signing day period that could be coming up here so we'll talk all that today folks before we do if you could just hit that like button for me would very much appreciate it if you like max's uh perspective or you, you don't and you still want to follow him you can follow him at m torres sports on twitter max there's a lot of people that hate follow me man they don't actually like my perspective but they want to hate follow you they just want to get after you tweet at you yeah. <laughs> exactly yeah they just want to pester me so first thing though we're going to talk about we have been already used to this now. At, at, at the end of December, I think this past year it was December 20th for the 2024 class. That is the first of two signing days and the second one happening in February. So there's one in December, one, uh, one in February for the, for the 2024 class. It has just been announced pretty recently that the first signing day is going to be pushed up for this year. So this is very pertinent to the 2025 class that will be signing this upcoming December or following into February. So Max, the way it used to be was it would be after the conference championship weekend before Christmas. And that would kind of be the, the, the sweet spot of players finalizing and signing and making their decision unless they wanted to use that second signing day period. Now it has been announced that the first signing day will be on the Wednesday after Thanksgiving, but before conference championship weekend. So let's talk about this all-encompassing. Your initial thoughts when you read this, because I think Nicole, Nicole Auerbach was the first one to put this out in the universe from The Athletic a few weeks ago, but obviously it has been finalized and it is tangible now. So just your early thoughts on this first signing day getting moved up three weeks. It's pretty wild how much change is occurring in the sport right now, Ryan. Not even just on the the signing period uh, talk. I know I was listening to uh, Josh Pate talk to Kirby Smart the other day. I know Brian just had him on to talk some ND. So if you guys check that one out, if you haven't already. Um, but he was just talking about how much stuff is going on in the sport right now. So this is obviously one that is right up my alley as someone who prioritizes covering recruiting. Um I think that the biggest thing is that it helps kind of avoid some overlap with the transfer portal opening. I know that was kind of the primary aim. Um, and it's kind of interesting when you look at it, it's not a huge, huge change just in terms of the amount of time that they're moving it up. But just because of how busy the month of December is, I think it is really helpful and it's going to help these college head coaches and really the programs just put some, some guardrails 
in place when it comes to what is a really insane month with conference titles, um, yeah. signing, um, playoff portal. now. Portal. <laughs> right. like, there's just so many things going on there. So I think it's it's a yeah. good move. I, when I first heard about it, I was like, oh, man, like that week is really chaotic. So it's a really hectic yeah. time. And like, you know, a lot of, you know, maybe we got a lot of clicks coming our way as far as just, you know, there's so much to talk about. So, yeah. but that's like set for what all these coaches and players have to deal with, I think it's a, a small sacrifice. So I think in the big picture, I think that, um, I think that it's good for the sport. Um, the, the early signing period being moved up um, because it's just going to help these coaches get a bit more clarity. And then I think ideally allow them to focus a bit more of their attention and their time on the, on their team with this expanded yeah. playoff. We'll have a lot more games in December. That was my initial thought was, I think you, you can kind of separate things a little bit easier now with this kind of moved up because the way, the way I think that it, it was really muddled, right? Because you went from signing day to conference championship to transfer portal all in a very small time frame, right? So like, that's a lot on a staff. I mean, we're not even talking about just the coaching staff. We're talking about the recruiting staff. We're talking about support staff, like everybody that's involved. I mean, there are colleges. I don't know how Oregon runs it now, but like a lot of colleges now are getting almost a separate department just to handle the transfer portal chaos. Like it, it's getting to that level around here, right? So I think the separation, just initial thought, is that it's good that you're kind of spreading it out a little bit. Now you have more uh, let's focus on the signing day. Let's get that out of the way. Now it's conference championships. Let's focus on our team. And then it's the transfer portal chaos still ensued. It's still going to be a chaotic few weeks. Like there's no doubt about it. But my initial thought is that it definitely kind of clears things up a little bit because I mean, I, I feel so bad for some of these teams, man. Like you, you're, you're riding high off the coverage championship, but then you have to deal with the transfer portal chaos. I mean, it's, we literally saw players, not as much on Michigan, but like there was a couple of playoff teams that lost a couple different players. To the Washington lost portal. everybody. <laughs> Yeah, during the chaos, man. And it's just like, what the heck? Like, how are we supposed to field a football team down the stretch? How are we supposed to kind of keep keep the momentum? And then especially with the second, the second um the second signing day, too. I mean, I guess you can argue that it gives them some time to like kind of pick up the pieces to the transfer portal chaos, but I mean, otherwise it's still really kind of a muddy situation that you get brought into. So I, I think that it it helps. I implications if we're going to talk about just Notre Dame and Oregon specifically right is that I don't think it changes much for Notre Dame and I would love to hear your perspective on Oregon because I, I was talking about with you beforehand by by all, the end of August right before the season even started last year Notre Dame had 23 commits in the class and they were done it was over like that was their class right now we are recording this on March 8th right that, that's the day today right I think mm -hmm. it's March 8th yep. March 8th, and Notre Dame has 17 commits in the class of 2025. Number one in the and country. That's it, baby. That's it. Who cares about volume? It's all about the number one <laughs> ranking. Who cares? But uh, Notre Dame is going to have a bigger class than it did last year. I could see it getting up to like 26, 27, 28, like somewhere in that ballpark. But regardless, Notre Dame is going to have their class pretty much filled out before the start of senior year. Like that's pretty much where you're going to be. So I don't think it affects Notre Dame as much. Would love to hear if it affects Oregon at all, because I know you guys do a little bit more later recruiting than what Notre Dame does specifically. As for Oregon side of things, I think they do tend to take a similar approach to, to what you mentioned with Notre Dame, as far as just trying to fill up their class before that senior year starts. Right now, Oregon has five commitments in the 2025 class, uh, and they haven't gotten a commitment in almost a month, which I wouldn't say is a concern. I think April is going to be a much busier month for Dan Landing and the Ducks on the recruiting trail. But they do, like you mentioned, uh, like to do some of that more long-haul recruiting, if you will. Uh, I think they'll have a majority of their class if they play all their cards right. It'll be wrapped up by the time the season starts. But then you have some of those blue-chip guys that maybe are already committed to other schools um, or maybe are heavily trending towards other schools, but you need to get them on campus a couple times this spring. I know the spring yep. game is their biggest recruiting event of the entire year. And then you also have a uh, Saturday night live uh, annual camp that they have at the end of July, like right around my birthday. That's why I remember it. Um, that is usually a, a pretty heavy hitter from a visit visitor perspective. So I think sure. that they'll still try to do that. But like you mentioned, they, they did get two of their biggest commits 
during the early signing period last year. Ryan Pelham, a local wide receiver okay. from just up the road in Long Beach, he flipped from USC. And then Jeremiah McClellan from St. Louis flipped from Ohio State to Oregon, which is a pretty crazy headline if you just consider the tremendous success that they've had developing receivers out there in Columbus. But that just shows you where Oregon's at right now as a recruiting power. So in a sense, I don't think it's going to affect things too much because it is only a little like a week or so earlier on the calendar, I believe, a week, 10 days. Um, so I think if anything, it's it's probably still a good thing because you're able to kind of wrap up your high school class maybe a little bit earlier than, than you expected. But I think the portal is probably what needs – some more help here because that's that's the the most chaotic element in the sport right now i think so max i love this chat because everyone is always so great with their commentary and questions but i needed to bring up this question from brandon plensner because it almost broke my heart to be honest we've talked about this we have literally texted about this before okay. but brandon just said matt is max happy that notre dame is not pursuing cooper perry anymore he wants he, he knows he like it really tugs at my heartstrings man because he knows how much i love cooper perry out of the state of arizona yeah, yeah. I mean, Cooper Perry is awesome. I actually just interviewed him last weekend. He was out here in SoCal for a seven on seven, but it was rainy. We've been getting so much rain on the weekends for whatever reason, so I didn't go. Um, but I mean, I, I, I don't know if I'd say I'm happy necessarily. I think Oregon's been the front runner there for a very long time, uh, but he's still taking a lot of visits. Um, doesn't sound like he's super close to, to making his decision necessarily. Um, yeah. I know Oklahoma is another one that is kind of staying involved there. Um, with, with Oregon, I think being viewed as the, the clear front runner, but he also visited USC this past weekend. So I know that with the way Oregon operates, they're really, really keen on the, the talent out of Arizona. They got a lot of people on staff with ties to Arizona and, and they've been continuing to recruit it. So he's a pretty special player, uh, doing a lot of lacrosse right now, uh, is what he was telling me. So he's got a busy schedule. But um, really, really good kid and, and a great player. So I think he'd be a great addition for Oregon. But there's a lot of time, Ryan. If we've learned anything, there is, there is a lot of time uh, between now and when these guys uh, you know, make their commitments and enroll. But I guess you would know more than me about Notre Dame's pursuit of him. Oh, man. I mean, I, I was texting with you about it. I, I truly believe that it because Cooper had been Notre Dame multiple times at, at, up until the point where they kind of cooled on him. And his grand his grandfather actually was a Notre Dame alum, like literally went to the the went to the school there. They really loved Notre Dame a lot. So I, I truly believe wholeheartedly. I, I know that you like you mentioned, Oregon Oregon has made, you know, Arizona obviously a little bit of a let's get the talent out of there. I mean, we talked we you were literally on this channel to talk about Elijah rushing, right? So mm -hmm. like that's just kind of for that context there. But I really believe Notre Dame would have got Cooper Perry. Truly do. I truly think if they would have pushed hard. If they would have stayed consistent, they would have got him. But unfortunately for my sanity, Notre Dame did like some other wide receivers better. I, I don't think it was the greatest evaluation of all time, to be honest with y'all. But hey, I don't make I don't make the big bucks, right? So yeah, it's uh unfortunate. We're gonna get into another part of the signing day, but Max, so many people have great questions for you, man. And and hey, I'm gonna I'm do here, a mail man. I'm gonna do the mailbag at the end. Max has to has to scoot after the second segment, though, folks. So if you want to throw mailbag questions in, get them in now. If there's anything that pertains to what Max, what you know, we want Max's perspective on, though, we can hit some of them on the first segment here because we're kind of sure. we're, we're talking about something important. But obviously, he they would love your perspective. This was a funny one because I remember talking to you when this happened. Brandon also said, "Oh my god, can we get the backstory of the 12 hour Peyton Bowen commitment to Oregon? Can we get the backstory there? <laughs> Tell them where you were when that happened." I think that's the funnier part of this conversation. <laughs> yeah. So um, I was in, um, geez, where, oh my God, I'm having a complete, I was in Prague uh, when this happened uh, on a little Christmas vacay with my mom and sister uh, during the early signing period for the class of 2023. So this is December, 2022. We're talking, I'm and Oregon had, I've been covering Oregon for about six years now, Ryan. Oregon yeah. had the single craziest signing day I have ever seen in my life. So some yes. more background on Bowen. We'll get more to him, but they got Mateo Uyunglele from St. John Bosco, um, who was, I think, trending towards Ohio State for a long time. Um, and then they also flipped Austin Novosad, a quarterback out of Texas yep. from Baylor. They flipped Dalen Austin, an LSU cornerback commitment, also from Long Beach. Uh, they flipped Jaden Lamar from Notre Dame. Uh, running back from from uh, Washington, so it was. And I'm trying to think if I'm missing anything there. 
Um, I think that was most of the guys that they got. I'm probably missing something, but it was insane. And they got Peyton, uh, of course. And I think really for him, you know, I'm sure you can speak to this a bit, Ryan, like you get your yeah. sources and kind of get them, you, you build those up over time. So I'm not kind of where I was now back then. Um, so I knew that Oregon was still on the radar and that, you know, they were trying to get him out to visit or anything. And when I saw that he committed, I was like, Oh my God, I can't believe this happened. Um, and, and it, and we were waiting for that, that, uh, letter to come in. Right. I was like, Oh wow. Five-star safety to Oregon. Like this is the, like, that is a difference making impact, a difference maker of a commitment because Oregon's got some good safeties come through in recent years. Javon Holland's obviously the best one. Uh, in recent memory, but they haven't had that that truly elite safety. I'm hoping Aaron Flowers can be that next guy after we saw him in San Antonio, Ryan. But that was absolutely insane. I didn't really have a lot of scoop necessarily on, on that one, but the commitment really caught me off guard. Um, and caught, uh, I, caught everyone every, off guard, man. Caught everyone no off guard. No one knew that was happening. Then, no one knew that was going to happen. It was wild. And I feel like it was a little bit of a – a little bit of a similar sentiment to the Jeremiah Smith commitment this year. Cause we were, everyone was waiting for that letter to come in. Yeah. And that yeah. was the same thing with, with Bowen. And then I think he said after he got to Oklahoma, he was like, Oh, we just like didn't put the date on it or some like super <laughs> small detail that somehow got lost in the shuffle. So it didn't end up happening. Oh, hilarious, man. Yeah. And, and someone mentions also Oregon, flips you know with you know with quotation marks Jaden lamar i mean we knew that that was happening though yeah like that was, yeah was we definitely knew that was happening foregone conclusion as soon as he said as soon as he said he was going to go take a visit you know it was kind of a understanding that that's what was happening there so yeah it was a it, that was a crazy signing day man absolutely crazy and it doesn't stop in your world either because i mean even transfer for a while is just getting dante Moore to transfer to oregon after being committed for a while and then flipping to UCLA and now coming back to when, Oregon. And when, like, he, and when he first got on my radar, Ryan, like I like I'm like this guy is for sure heading to Notre Dame. I feel like he was in South Bend every other weekend. Michigan was kind of involved. He went out to Miami and LSU. He visited just about everywhere. A and M was yeah. involved, I think, at one point. Um, yeah. But the fact that he's there now, and I remember when I put his story out after his he visited UCLA, I was like. You Oregon like does Oregon need to be concerned about losing Dante Moore? And then my followers like, Max, you're totally just blowing smoke, man. This is ridiculous. And then there and you then go. Happened. Ended up flipping. <laughs> Once Dylan Hand left, you knew that was going to happen. I mean, come on. Yeah, yeah. It, it the the writing was definitely on the wall. It was definitely on the wall. Well, let's talk. Let's talk about talk about the future here, Max, because we talked about the obviously the first signing day getting moved up the couple weeks there after Thanksgiving, but there's also at least it's on the table and it's being discussed and it hasn't been finalized yet, but like it, it's, people are pushing for it. They're potentially being a third signing day. Okay. And this one is a legitimate early signing day would we'll start next year in 2025. So we'll be talking about the 2026 recruiting class at that point, June, 2025 is the proposal that's on the table. And again, has not been finalized. I have mixed feelings on this one, to be honest with you. I have mixed feelings. I do think that there's a lot of validity to an early signing day, especially for a, a Notre Dame, right? That finishes most of their class in the summer. Like most of those guys are just signed to deliver, and it's only a matter of putting your pen to the paper in a couple months after that. But I would say June kind of feels a little bit iffy to me. Like I would have probably wanted more like late July, August, as far as a signing day. I don't know. That's my initial impulse. I don't know if you agree with that, but just your initial thoughts on the, on the early signing day potential in 2025. I've seen a lot of it um, as far as just, you know, being floated out there. Um, I think that, yeah, may maybe July would make a bit more sense, especially because um, most of July is dead, I believe, until late July because um, Oregon has that camp. So I know they're always coming right out of the dead period at that point. Some people have even talked about just when you get your offer, hey, here's a letter as well. If you want it, if you're about it, just sign it whenever you're ready. So I think there is some like that could save a lot of people, a lot of headaches. Cause I mean, there's right. probably, there's gotta be, I don't even know what number to put on this, but there's gotta be a handful of guys out there right now that are mm -hmm. like, without a doubt going to a certain school, but Hey, let me take these visits. Let me play it up. Let me get the hype going around it. Um, you know, let me do some more traveling and having fun. I think it's just tough because I, if I were a recruit, Ryan, I would milk the heck out of everything. I would wait until the last possible second 
to to recruit. Um, and maybe it's in, a little bit in, different in, now. In the NIL era, right? Like, yeah, in the, the NIL era. Like, and now yeah. the they're getting rid of the photo shoots because, oh, my God, that was that was the problem uh, with yes. what was going on in today's era of college football. But, like, I would be running up my social media accounts with visit pictures and, and all of that. But I think that the summer does seem a little bit early. The big thing that I kind of think about, and I guess this would happen even with the December one, what if you sign your NLI and then your coach bounces? Like they're going to have to put some paperwork, some some language in these national letters of intent to allow because it happens. You know, people get sure. out of their their letters of intent. I think about you know Demon Williams from Arizona. He was committed yeah. to Arizona and he put on a show at the All Star game that we watched. Um, and then he ended up following Fish to to Washington. So I feel like. I don't know, maybe it's easier in some cases than others because there's always like circumstances at play and whatnot. But I think the earlier that you push it, you still have to give some of these guys flexibility because there's so much coaching movement every single year. Sure. Yeah, that, that, that's the tough part, too, of the early signing day is that you're because like you said, and you're 100 percent correct. The, every year you see guys that ask out of their national level of intents after the second signing day, right? Where you're just like, okay, man, I mean, you had a lot of time to figure this out, right? Like this is a, this is crazy, but I do think that's probably the drawback to doing it so early, especially because again, if it was late July, August, I feel like this would be less, but like June is still pretty early to make that decision forthcoming, right? Because then that's a lot of months afterwards until you're officially even even for the early enrollees that is several months before you could even get on campus. So I do think that you would come into some situations where college, some colleges I think would be pressing kids to do that early signing, right? Like press, 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 press. And then it might come back, you know, a few weeks after that, or a few months after that, or before that second signing day and being like, Hey, I want out of my national letter of intent. Like I I need out of it. And unfortunately we've seen, well, I don't say unfortunately, we, I just, a, a, I guess, a something I've seen or I've observed is that, they usually get out of it, right? Like there's barely ever any colleges that hold a player hostage to a national letter of intent. Usually if they want out of it dearly, they'll let a player out of it. So I think that you could also kind of poke holes in the validity of that early signing day, but for Notre Dame specifically, and again, we'll talk about the Oregon implications here, but for Notre Dame, I think this early signing day is a good thing. I, I think it really is. I don't actually like, that there's three potential signing days. I think that that's like overkill for me. Like maybe you should just do two and you just use the early signing day as one of those and maybe bump the other one back a little bit. Like maybe that's what, what the solution is. But for Notre Dame, again, 23 commits that were all committed in August of this past season or before the season, they all signed with Notre Dame. There was never any really, there was never even really any back and forth like debate over, you know, decommitment or taking visits. Like it just, that just wasn't in the universe. This year, Notre Dame has 17 commits in the class. We'll see if they're able to stay intact. As of today, there's not really anybody in Notre Dame's class that worries me as far as like a decommitment potentially on the rise horizon. Like I, I don't necessarily see it right now. So we'll see if that changes. But I, I think Notre Dame for the most part are early recruiters. They're trying to get the class done, finalized before the season. And then they kind of, like they kept their eyes on Max. I don't know if you remember Nandi Boko that signed with Georgia this past year out of North Carolina. Mm-hmm. Like they had him for a visit and like they were interested in trying to get him a part of the class, but he ended up staying committed to Georgia. But so maybe Notre Dame will continue to do some stuff like that during the season, but ultimately it's not like a priority for them. It's, it's kind of what I'm saying. They're still trying to get that done and figure it out before the season start and just kind of maintain their class all the way through. I know you said that Oregon has a similar strategy but do you think that that would change their strategy at all if there was an early signing day um i don't i don't think i think they're early recruiters as well but the the other point that i was thinking could be worth bringing to the table um is is just the value in that senior season if you if you have this early signing period uh in the summer I think that, you know, say, for example, you sign a bunch of guys and like you're like on the one hand, you're like, oh, man, we're kicking back. We're chilling like we can just focus on the next class. But but what I think about those guys that are that need their senior season to to get some of these looks that are kind of the diamond in the roughs or the late bloomers, if you will. Um, what, What does this mean? What does this mean for them? You talk about I know one of the discussion points with the transfer portal is that it's hurting 
uh, high school recruits and junior college recruits because the, these colleges are going into the portal to get guys that are ready made. But I mm -hmm. think I almost view it in a somewhat similar light with the early signing period, how it's like, hey, if you haven't been good enough, if you haven't been good enough through your junior year to prove that you can play at our school, like, you know, sorry, you're not, you know, you're not, you're not good enough yet. Like, I just feel like there's probably some kids that could end up being, you know, flying under the radar, or maybe they don't end up at a Notre Dame or an Oregon because they've already gotten their letters. So they're already full at that position and they don't want to take guys unless it's from the portal. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that comes down to the evaluation part of the process too, right? Like that, that's, that is a great point is that, I mean, Notre Dame has literally seen a couple guys that are like late breakout senior dudes that you're just like, I didn't even know about who that kid was. And then all of a sudden he's just an absolute stud. I don't know if you know, I don't think Oregon's offered him, but Notre Dame is is pursuing a young man out of the state of Kentucky named Javion Campbell, who's a defensive lineman. O Ohio State actually just offered him yesterday. Or the, yesterday. He, they offered him yesterday. And he is one of those guys, Max. He didn't play football until his, until his junior year of high school. Didn't yeah, play football. Exactly. So, like, for that kid, he's going to blow up, right? And, and there's going to be some of those cases. I don't think that's going to be so much that it kind of – you know, kills the process, but overall there are going to be some of those kids. I agree that fall through the cracks and you're going to have to figure out if you can fit them into the class or you can't fit them in the class. Like that's just going to be a very interesting, that's going to be an interesting, it's going to be interesting to see if that changes the evaluation process at all. Right. Because there are those kids every single year that you just don't know much about. Like I, I didn't know about the Damon Williams kid, the the quarterback, and so we were even down in San Antonio, right? Like, oh, I mean, there's yeah, so many no, he was talented kids it. out there, man. It's wild. So, and yeah. and the other thing too was, um, I think on a different note, um, maybe saying that it's good, uh, the summer signing period that is, maybe it's gonna hold these colleges more accountable. Like, right. don't offer a guy if it's not committable because he might yeah. sign, and then maybe there's a late bloomer that you're really intrigued about, and you're like, well. I already have this guy locked in and I can't process him right. out as, as easily as I was in the past. I'll give you another example. So Notre Dame actually has a safety that is a, about to enter a sophomore year. He's a 2023 kid. His name's Luke Talich. Okay. So he was a Utah kid who had offers from Washington state, Oregon state, Utah. Like he had some legit pack pac, pac 12 offers. And, but he didn't have a he didn't have Oregon or anything like that. But he had some like legitimately good offers. And Max, he ended up he ended up coming to Notre Dame as a preferred walk on to start. He was a preferred wow. walk on because he wanted to go, he wanted to go to Notre Dame. He actually just got a scholarship offer the, the, a couple weeks uh, like recently. So he's now on scholarship at Notre Dame. But I worry about a kid like that because if it is in July, if it's in June, excuse me, and a player like Luke Talich is out there who. Notre Dame is pursuing, but pursuing as a preferred walk-on. They didn't, if they, and if they didn't have time to really put in the work and to develop that relationship, maybe he goes to Utah instead. Maybe he goes to Washington State. The clear path, right, to a scholarship. Like, there's so many of those cases that I think are really interesting and could flip it upside down a little bit. But again, I don't know if there's enough of those occurrences to make it a massive deal overall. So. We'll see. We'll see what, what happens if that is passed. Again, we're talking about a potential third signing day, an actual early signing period added June 2025. It's on the table. We'll see if it happens. We're going to talk about some recruits next year, folks, some 2025 and 2026 kids. Notre Dame and Oregon have implications in all the players that we're going to talk about here next. Before we do, make sure you hit that like button for us. Make sure you hit that subscribe button and that notification bell if you're listening to us live on youtube you can also follow max at m torres sports on twitter and check out all his stuff over at ducks digest on fan nation but we'll be talking about some 2025 2026 recruits here next on the irish breakdown podcast all right max prospect talk let's do it man i'm pumped for this i really am because we have only a couple 2025 kids that I would say are legitimately like Notre Dame, oh, Notre Dame, Oregon. I don't want to say battles because there's other teams involved, Overlaps. but like they, they over, yeah, they have the overlap here with a couple of players. I specifically about this first player, not as much about the second guy because I don't think it's a, to a totally realistic option for Notre Dame. The second player we'll talk about, but the first one surely is okay. And I misspoke earlier in the first segment. I said Luke Talish was from Utah, he's from Wyoming. 
Brandon Pleasner in the chat. <laughs> Always count on you, Brandon. Always count on you, man. My apologies to Luke. Who congratulations to Luke, by the way, because I think his dad might listen to the podcast sometimes. And he knows that we were big fans of him coming out of the state of Wyoming and I'm glad that he just got his scholarship offer or got his scholarship fully at Notre Dame, which was great to see. First guy I want to talk about Danville, California, Stan Ramon Valley defender. I'm just going to call him defender Marco Jones because he is a player at now listed at, and he actually verified this with me a, a few weeks ago, Max. Six foot five, 230 pounds, plays inside linebacker, plays on the edge a little bit for San Ramon Valley, but there's a possibility that he might just keep growing, might end up being a defensive end on the next level. He can also just play on the second level and be a really tall athletic linebacker, right? So dynamic football player, dynamic. And we had him on the channel a few weeks ago. He mentioned Oregon as a school that he was interested in. I think he mentioned USC at that point. Notre Dame was obviously in the conversation. I believe he had mentioned Alabama. I could be wrong about that one. And he mentioned Maryland, which was kind of a weird one. An interesting kind of throw in there. But yeah. But Marco, I know we both have had a chance to talk to him. He's been on this channel. Let's talk about him as a player first, man, before we talk about like wh wh where you think Oregon is with him. And I'll talk about where Notre Dame is with him. Just a unique football player, man. You just don't see too many linebackers, like true inside linebackers at six foot five, two thirty, that can also come up on the line of scrimmage, can play defensive end full time. I watched this kid's film the first time after junior year, Max, because I knew Notre Dame was on him and he liked Notre Dame. But holy smokes, this kid's different, man. Like he's a different type of athlete on the defensive side of the ball. He really is a special talent. I think that was the the thing that kind of stuck out to me is just how tall he is to play inside linebacker. I, I think most of your guys that you're probably seeing kind of top out at 6'3", potentially, uh, at that inside linebacker spot. So for him to have that length and have the mobility to play that position, especially the, the lateral quickness and change of direction, is something that you just don't see super often. I think I have a little bit of an extra interest in him because he is from Northern California, which is where I'm from. Um, I had one of the people in his camp, one of the coaches in his camp, tell me about him. Uh, I want to say maybe like a year and a half ago, and I had no idea who he was. And he's like, Max, this guy's going to be a stud. And I was like, all right, I'll, I'll trust you. And, you know, he was the same guy that also told me a bit about Relique Brown, who was also from Northern California originally. Now he's at Arizona State after spending some time at USC. So I can definitely trust this guy, but two sport athlete, you talk about what he can do on the football field and the baseball field. It's pretty insane. Um, yeah. I know that he's continuing to develop as, as a pass rusher as well. I think that's where I always get intrigued because it's so hard to find quality pass rushers, especially in 2025, because the, the D line talent just isn't as, as deep out West as it was last cycle. So he's a guy who can do just about anything you ask him. I think he's also, I don't want to say he's a project by any means, but just because he is his so big, growing. I think you're yeah. still trying to figure out where his best true fit is once he gets to college. So that's just an interesting aspect as well. So Notre Dame has affirmed this to us multiple times, Max, that they view Marco as an inside linebacker right now, but who knows how his body develops. Have you see, heard or your, any intel as far as, how does Oregon see him? Like, are they recruiting him purely as a defensive end? Do they want, intend to give him a, a spot at linebacker if he does end up with Oregon? Like, how do they view him in your eyes? Yeah, I think – so I, ha I haven't spoken to someone at Oregon about Marco in a little bit, but I, I tend to think they think of him as more of an edge guy. Um, but I just have to – because I think more about their linebacker board, guys like Madden Faramo, who we've talked about, uh, Noah McHale as well. Uh, yes. I think they, those are some of the more true inside guys that they are looking at right now. And, and they have some good momentum recruiting the position, especially after what they did in 2024. Um, so I think they look at him more as kind of a true edge. And, and I think that they're probably a team that maybe isn't getting a ton of, if they're not getting a ton of buzz in this recruitment, I feel like that might be because they have other guys that they're looking at a little bit harder. Um, gotcha. Because if you think about it, Ryan, Tosh LaPoy yep. has been able to kind of, kind of almost handpick the guys on defense out of uh, Northern California that he's wanted. Uh, Jericho Johnson, obviously, who we saw out in San Antonio 
uh, the top defensive prospect out of the Bay Area. Um, and then this year they just got Matthew Johnson out of De La Salle, which is where Tosh Lapoy went no, to high school. No, Notre Dame liked Matthew Johnson too. I, I was hoping that Notre Dame would have a little bit of a chance there. I, I know he was on the board. He was a guy that they definitely liked because they just got Cooper Flanagan, you know, in 2023. So mm -hmm. I was hoping that we continue there, but Johnson's a good player, man. So that was a good get for the Ducks early. Yeah, I think he he's the guy that obviously was on Oregon's radar because of Lapoy. And um, yep. his tape is really, really impressive. Just, I think, a, kind of a pure pass rusher, but has a lot of athleticism to add some more moves to his tool bag. Um, yep. But but as for Marco, I think <clears throat> if they really want him, I wouldn't be surprised if he ended up coming out to campus uh, a little bit in, in the spring. Because if you think about it, Ryan, I think those guys that uh, they really, really wanted in our priorities yep. in 2025, they had already visited uh, in 2023 or prior. And then they had yep. two junior days, uh, late January and then in February before it went dead. Like those guys, you had to make sure you get them on campus. And then now it's kind of, all right, let's get these guys on campus for some spring practice at the spring game and then sure. uh, take their officials in late spring, early summer and and try to wrap this thing up. So it's it's nice to be able to project it a little bit more. You track the visits and, uh, you know, you talk to people and you can kind of get a real feel for where guys are at. So. I'm not yep. counting Oregon out by any means for Marco Jones. I think he's he's someone that's uh, super, super intriguing. And, and you know, I, I hope um, selfishly that they get a little bit more involved maybe and we hear some more buzz between him and the Ducks. Yeah, and you, you mentioned a player that I originally wasn't even going to talk about, but now that you mentioned him, Oregon definitely does, you know, is pursuing him and Notre Dame is very much pursuing him because just kind of mark, mark, to wrap up the Marco Jones conversation, I think Notre Dame's in a pretty good spot with Marco. Like, I, I like their chances. I think they need to get him back, definitely for an official. But if they can get him back for an unofficial visit before official season uh, kicks off a little bit later this offseason, I think they'll have a good chance in the end. Like, I think it's either I'll, – I'll phrase it like this, and I truly believe this. I think either Marco stays out west or he comes to Notre Dame. That, I, that's, where I th that's where I think this one lies today. So – I'll see, I'll see if I'm I'm right in the end, but he is a player that Notre Dame's got a little bit of a big linebacker board right now, but Marco has been a guy that has been a priority on that board for a long time, so they've been pursuing him heavily. You mentioned another guy, though. Laverne, California, Bonita High School linebacker, Noah McHale, six foot three, 210, 215 pounds. He lists himself at 220. Don't believe you, Noah. All due respect. Don't believe you're 220 yet, sir, but we'll see. He's a player also, Max. He was actually offered by Notre Dame during his sophomore season, which is kind of a very early like, – they don't usually offer guys quite that early. But he was offered early, and at the time, he had called Notre Dame his dream school. Now, that doesn't always mean anything, right? That that Because dreams change and, you know, different things come into play and, and opinions change on schools. But – Notre Dame had some pretty good early momentum with Noah McHale. Now he's getting back to campus this offseason, which is a great sign for Notre Dame because he had not been back to campus since last offseason, did not make a game day visit this past year. So getting him back is big time. Now I need to see how that visit goes because I'm just kind of I'm kind of indifferent on the the Noah McHale recruitment for Notre Dame right now. I think that he likes Notre Dame. What I but I, I'll phrase it like this, and I would love to hear your insight from the Oregon side. I don't know if there's necessarily a leader for Noah McHale right now. Like, I don't know if I would call anybody a leader. I feel like this next couple months getting on campuses is really going to determine where he ends up, whether it's staying on the West coast, going to Oregon, going to USC, coming to Notre Dame, maybe going down to sec country. And it, there's a lot of different places that I think Noah McHale could end up. And I think the next couple months are going to be big time to figure that out. This spring is is one of the most crucial stretches for a lot of these top recruits because they have a good feel, I think, for their tops, and then they can kind of work on those top schools. Um, but I think Oregon has a really good shot here with Noah McHale. I know that Tosh Lapoy and, and Brian Michalowski, uh, their linebackers coach, went out to see him in Southern California uh, during the contact period in, in January, and and um, I, and Oregon's in a good spot, but. Um, you know, Notre Dame is another one that is is obviously in the mix there. I think, sure. like, in, until I see otherwise, Ryan, and I, I don't want to make this, like, blanket statement because I can definitely be sure. proven wrong. Like, Oregon sure. is is the top West Coast guys. They're going to be on Oregon's radar 
for a fact. I mean, you see what yep. they did with, with Dylan Williams and Kamar Matuti um, this past year, two Southern California guys. Um, the staff I, I, I is love, just... I, I love hearing you say the word, the name Matuti, by the way. It's fantastic, man. Sorry. Sorry to cut you off there. No, you're good. You're good. I mean, I don't know if you got to talk to Kamar, but he's an awesome kid and he's yeah. really fun to talk to. Um, but yeah, th- all those guys are Dylan Williams isn't in Eugene just yet. I don't think, but um, they've done a really good job recruiting the linebacker spot. I think that they have a good case to send another couple of linebackers to the league this next year with Jeff Bossa, the former safety, and then yep. uh, Justin Jacobs as well, who, who's hopefully going to have a full season now after transferring from Iowa before the 23 year. And then an injury forced him to miss about half the season, really. So um, yeah. that's obviously another part that plays into the equation is who are you sent into the league and who have you recruited recently? And then your geographic kind of uh, sweet spots. We know that California has certainly been a huge one for Oregon. So I think they'll be involved till the very end for McHale. Yep. I, I think that Oregon is obviously a big threat for Noah McHale. Again, I think the you said it spring is going to be huge to determine where his ultimate destination is. But we'll see, man. We'll see. Notre Dame obviously got a big one this past cycle with Kingston Villiamoasa out of the state of California. So can they continue to train in Cali? We'll see. I think Noah McHale and Marco Jones are their best two shots. I know Madden Faremo, who we've talked about a little bit, he he mentioned Notre Dame of Harvest Top Four. I don't think that that's a completely reasonable one right now. I mean, we'll see, you know, if Notre Dame is able to make headway down the stretch, but uh, what are your feelings just on Madden Framo, the other star linebacker out of 2020, uh, out of California in the 2025 cycle? Do you think Oregon has a legit chance there? I would say they do, um, especially with how small of a group he's working on at the, or from at this point in the calendar year. I think that's another thing that helps them. I'll be honest, Ryan, like I knew the name Madden Framo, but I didn't yeah. know that Oregon was really that involved until his top sure. schools came out. And then I threw his tape yep. on it. I'm like, this dude flies around as a linebacker. He's uh, huge from too, San man. Diego. He looks like, he looks like Frankenstein a little bit, dude. He's just like this broad, like big dude moving around, man. He's a massive kid. Yeah. He's, he's fun to watch. I haven't got to see him in person just yet, but he's originally from San Diego and uh, transferred to J Sarah Catholic in the, the Trinity league, um, which, you know, a lot of people widely consider as the toughest league in high school football in the country. Um, so LA has always got, you know, good linebackers and, you know, Kingston Billy was the, the latest one um, that's going to be headed out to Notre Dame. So I think that we'll see if, if Ramo gets on campus, I think he tends to play his cards pretty close to the vest. Um, not a huge social media guy. So as, as you know, that can make things a little bit harder to track uh, every <laughs> yes. now and then. Um, but I think, you know, again, like, I don't know, it's, it feels late that I'm just now learning about for Ramo, but, I think Oregon's still got a good shot um, with, with him. It's going to be interesting to see how the rest of that linebacker board shakes out. The, the biggest question mark for me for Oregon in this 25 class right now is probably a little bit more on the D line, just because okay. they don't have the Jericho Johnsons and the Aiden Breelands out West Elijah rushing. You can obviously put him in the Western blueprint as well. Um, yep. So they're, they're kind of have going to have to go more national, I think. Uh, so I'm, I'm glad they got things started with Matthew Johnson. Yeah, no, no, that was a really good start. And it, Madden, Madden's a fun one, Max. I don't know if I ever told you this one. So we unveiled the curtain a little bit. I actually had like two or three interviews with Madden uh, when he was, uh, I guess, before his junior year or during his junior year, I guess, you know, when he was kind of still early in his recruitment. And then I guess he's just kind of nearing closer and closer to decision making mode. He's like, I'm not talking to anybody. I'm just trying to figure that thing out type of thing. You know, he kind of, you know, he kind of gives me, he gives me vibes of Kingston a little bit as far as like personally sure. keeping everything close, closer to the vest and just kind of, he's a very, he's a very spiritual guy. He's a very religious guy. Like he kind of gives me those vibes, but I, I don't think Notre Dame obviously has the inside track on that one. And uh, yeah, but we'll see either way. I wanted to throw a name out there for you that we're going to talk about, but I would kind of phrase it like this. Then we're going to talk about 2026 quarterbacks that Notre Dame is very involved in. And we'll talk about that one, but I wanted to throw out the name Trey McNutt, who people know the name because he's been on Notre Dame's board for a while. Now he's out of Cleveland, Ohio, Shaker Heights, 2025 kid, Notre Dame. I would say this just easily about Trey McNutt. I don't think Notre Dame is going to end up getting Trey McNutt, which is full transparency. I think they're probably a top three to four school for Trey McNutt, but I don't think they're one or two. I, I would just kind of phrase it like that. I think he likes Notre Dame. I don't. I think that he likes other schools more, just flat out. But there was some big news recently, pretty recent. It's probably a couple weeks ago now, I guess. 
Trey McNutt's heading out to Oregon at some point. He's visiting this offseason. I believe I saw that in the universe. So latest on Trey McNutt, a guy that people know in this circle. And we actually have a Ohio State fan in the chat, Archer, who knows Trey McNutt very well, obviously, and being an Ohio guy. Yeah, yeah. Trey McNutt is uh is you know a big a big prospect. Obviously, he's on just about everybody's radar uh, across the country. Um, and he he took his first visit, I want to say it was to Oregon uh in in january or no i think it was february right before it went dead um he was one of those top prospects that that was in in on campus and um i didn't really think that oregon was much of a contender but like i'm sure you've heard this with with uh notre dame ryan like sometimes it only takes one visit um like the the if you're looking for the biggest how impactful one visit can be i always liken this i always think back to the example of Kayvon thibodeau he he took his official visit to oregon uh against washington in 2018 which was when the ducks beat washington for the first time in like three years i want to say it was so like eugene and Austin was just going absolutely uh insane and he loved the atmosphere and all that and like that's what really sold him um for that experience it's it's getting harder and harder to read that with like nil and the portal and everything that's going on in today's game but you only need one visit to really kind of get in the running for, for some of these guys. So I don't think Oregon's necessarily a, a, a front runner for Trey McNutt by any means. Uh, but he did say that he wanted to, to get back out there um, after getting to spend time with uh, one of, one of Oregon's up and coming coaches, Rashad Wadud, who works with the corners. He's, I guess he's an analyst technically, but he's a big name uh, on the staff. And I think that um, he's going to get back down. He, he said he wants to go and take his mom with him to, to see Eugene she didn't get to go on the first trip. Um, but I think it's, it's hard to see a guy, a top guy getting out of the state of Ohio. I mean, they do a really good job putting up a, a, a wall around that state just to keep other, other schools out. Um, yep. I mean, every now and then you'll have a guy that goes to Notre Dame or goes to a Michigan. Um, sure. So it's, it's been done, but it, I mean, the way that Ohio state's recruiting right now in 2025, my God um, it's, it's impressive. It's really impressive. <laughs> Yes, especially the defensive backfield, man. Devin Sanchez and those dudes so far. Naheem Ox, um, what, what, uh, what's Offered. the other corner's name? Offered. I almost said yeah. Oxford. Like the yeah, very smart kid apparently. Going to Oxford. Uh, now let's go to 2026 quarterbacks. This one is very important to talk about because he has literally been the Notre Dame and Oregon this offseason. 2026 quarterback out of Newberry Park, California High School, Brady Smigel, who is listed at six foot five. 205 pounds, rated as the number 21 overall player, number two quarterback, and a five-star on the 247 Sports composite ranking. So a big-time dude out of Newberry Park. He visited Oregon a couple weeks after he visited Notre Dame. Let's give the perspective on this one real quick, Max. So I would... You just said a player isn't as serious. It, it, sometimes a player isn't serious about a team or they aren't a serious contender until they visit campus, right? Mm -hmm. And I would contend that that's Notre Dame in Brady Smigel right now is that okay. I think Brady was interested in Notre Dame, okay? interested in Notre Dame. They came out to see him during the open period, see him throw and everything at Newberry Park. Cool. They like, cool. Good conversation, right? But... Then he comes out for junior day a few weeks, a few weekends ago. I think it was like five weekends ago at this point. And he left that visit just almost in awe. It felt like, right? Like he talked about how his dad told him and his dad's the head coach at Newberry park. He was talking about how his dad said like, Oh, Notre Dame's just kind of a different place. Like, you'll know when you, you get there and you experience it, like it's just very unique and, and it's just hard to explain. And I think that happened to Brady Smigel. I really do, man. Like I, I just thought he was a, he was a great quarterback on the board that was slightly intrigued by Notre Dame. But I think leaving that visit, I think there's a lot of interest in Notre Dame, a lot of interest. And fortunately for me and our relationship, you sent me the interview that you did with Brady Smigel after he had visited Oregon. So get us the Oregon side of things here, because it sounds like Notre Dame and Oregon could be big players here for Brady Smigel. Hey, what do you know? One of the best quarterbacks in the country coming from SoCal. Never heard that before. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's become, it's become, you know, where you look for, for a lot of the best quarterbacks in the country. And I think Oregon got involved with Brady Smigel, got him on campus. So they're, they're doing the right things now, still really early in 26. But if we've learned anything from 2025, the top quarterbacks come off the board early, 
Uh, obviously, Notre Dame knows that, and they got a great one in the fold with with uh, De- Deuce Knight, right? That's his name, Deuce Knight. That's his name. Um, yep, you got it. Um, so he he seems like he's locked in, uh, and then Oregon has Achilles Smith Jr. the the legacy, but I think they got a a, a good early standing with with Brady Smigel uh, again. I, I don't know. I don't want to. I don't want to say it's like easy to boil some of these things down, but to some degree, like after you've seen it for long enough, and like knowing the brand power that Oregon and Notre Dame both have, like you can kind of connect some of the dots and be like, okay, they probably have a, a decent chance here, or at least kind of stay alive. Um, but I think they're they're going to continue to keep an eye on Brady Smigel and, and stay involved there. Um, they're, they're, he's not the only quarterback they're looking at, obviously, in 2026. But he really does seem – I don't know if I'm just saying this because of because I heard him talk about his faith. He does kind of seem like he fits that Notre Dame mold, you know, Notre Dame type, type of guy. Um, sure. like I, I feel like hearing what you had to say about his visit, you know, every, it made a lot of sense. Um, and it sounds like he's really, really interested in, in what Notre Dame has to offer, um, both on and off the field. Well, and, and I think one, one quote he had during your interview with him was about how important his faith was. Right. And like, oh, that usually, tur- that, that usually trends pretty well for Notre Dame, obviously for, for the easy reasons to understand there. So we'll see though. I mean, cause you made a you made a point, and I would 100 percent agree on it. It's very early, man. 2026. I mean, Notre Dame right now. I don't know how many Oregon's offered in 2026 a quarterback, but I think Notre Dame's offered seven, and I would say they're in pretty good standing with like four of them right now. <laughs> like they're Dang. they're trending pretty well in in quarterback recruiting as of today. I forgot that you guys got Achilles Smith Jr. By the way, that is wild, man. That Achilles Smith Jr. is a quarterback in today's world. Dude, he's wild. massive. He's he like six six, absolutely- right? He's yeah, he, he towers over me. He's taller than his dad. Um, my my sister lives in San Diego, so I've had a couple of chances to go out and see him uh, in person. And like, I'm so excited about that guy's upside because he's a giant, but he can move, man. Like, if he can add some more to you know mobility and like just some more run game to his arsenal, he's gonna be really, really special. Which is hilarious because for people that don't remember, like Achilles Smith, his father was a solid athlete but like he wasn't a runner you know what i mean like which is kind of hilarious that that's kind of what happens right like it's really interesting Let, let's talk about another 2026 california quarterback that both schools are involved with that's mr Ryder lyons who's out of folsom california i think most notre dame fans know the school folsom because they got rico flores jr in the uh 2023 class now he is now playing with the with UCLA and the Sean Foster, so uh, we'll see how his career ends up there. But I would say this, and I saw someone say it in the chat, Max. I, I would kind of portray it like this: If you had to t- ask me, who do I think is Notre Dame's top guy at quarterback? Not the only guy, because I still think they like Brady Smigel. I think that there is a couple of Troy Hewn who they just offered. Like they like some other guys. You know, Cart, um, Brady Hart's coming up for a visit, the Florida kid to Notre Dame this off season. So is um, uh, the quarterback's name is, is I'm blanking on the quarterback's name for some reason. Give me one second. I literally just wrote an article about him. Where is it? Where is it? Oh, <laughs> man. This is called stalling on a podcast. Noah no, Grubbs. I Noah totally Grubbs, another Noah Grubbs, another Florida kid. He, he's a kid that Notre Dame is getting for a visit this offseason as well. So they're in good standing with several guys. But if you had to put a gun to my head and say, who is Notre Dame? Who's Notre Dame's top guy on the board right now? If you had to name one. I'd probably say Ryder Lyons. He would probably be the guy that I would I would point to right now. More of a dual threat quarterback compared to Brady Smigel, for instance. Brady is a just pocket savant, right? Like he is a thrower of the football. Ryder almost had a thousand yards rushing last year for Folsom. I'm watching his film to, at the same time. He can run, man. He can move. He's a very, very talented athlete at the quarterback position. Obviously, his older brother was in the 2023 class, Walker Lions, out of Folsom as well. That ended up, he was at Stan, he was committed to Stanford, ended up going to uh, USC, and he's on his Mormon mission now, I believe, his LDS mission. So, mm-hmm. Ryder Lions, let me get that, that's the that's the perspective from Notre Dame. He's been to campus, uh, has actually hasn't been to campus yet at Notre Dame. He hasn't set up any visits yet this offseason. I know he just finished a basketball season. He told me probably about a week ago that he's going to start to figure out kind of some travel plans. And he told me that Notre Dame would be one of those schools. But your perspective on from the Oregon side, Mr. Ryder Lyons. Ryder Lyons is a fun quarterback to watch, man. Oh, my God. You guys got to watch his tape if you haven't already. But 
Um, yeah, they're they're involved with with Ryder Lions, kind of like we said with with Brady Smigel. Too kind of too early to call anything. Or I, I have I have uh, one of um, I'm pretty close to one of Ryder's coaches, so I kind of feel like I want to. After talking about him, I'm getting excited and I want to hit them up and see what's going on. Um, but you know, it's, you know, kind of that similar story, you know, a West coast guy, Northern California is obviously great for the ducks, uh, same school that produced Jake Browning, Jonah Williams, um, in, in recent years, my high school actually was the first high school to beat Folsom on their home blue field in like five years or something, whatever it was, uh, nice. back in 2015, my senior year. Um, so then we punched our ticket to the, to the state title game, but Nice. Ryder's a special player, super special player. I think when you watch him, I kind of think a little bit Baker Mayfield with his with his creativity. Um, obviously, I think that's you know he's he hit the peak of his athleticism at a uh, at Oklahoma, but like I just think a guy who can get it done, got great wheels, uh, can really spin it, is super creative, um, good at throwing off platform. I, I love Ryder Lions, and and he's certainly going to be one of the top guys nationally. The offers just keep coming. Um, I mean, I guess yes. Florida State hopped in for him recently. So everybody's going to be after this kid by the time his uh, his senior year comes around. It's funny. He's not ranked by any platform yet. Yeah. But his what? offer list is bananas, dude. <laughs> like, it is a very impressive offer list. So, yeah, that, that'll change pretty quickly. But, yeah, last time I looked, they he did not have a ranking from anybody despite having offers from Notre Dame, Oregon, Arizona State, Cal, Colorado, Florida, Florida State, Georgia, Michigan, A&M. Ole Miss, AM, Oregon State, Pittsburgh, UCLA, USC, Utah, Virginia Tech, Washington, and Washington State. Those are his power five offers right now, which is pretty wild. So he's he's a pretty good player. Pretty good player is, is all that to say. So Oregon involved with Ryder Lions. Notre Dame involved with Ryder Lions, very talented football players that we'll see what happens. I mean, because the, the quarterback class for 2026, uh, it, it's a long way to be written. I know quarterbacks tend to come off the board a little bit earlier, typically because they are big hand in helping recruit recruiting classes, right? So their mm -hmm. presence is, is definitely needed in recruiting classes. But regardless, Notre Dame's in a pretty good spot with a couple of those kids, and we'll see if that continues. Before I let you get out of here, I wanted to get your opinion on a couple of California wide receivers because it seems like the only the only wide receivers Notre Dame has has offered so far for the most part is California kids. Like they're just going after West Coast wide receivers right now in 2026. So a couple guys you have seen, I know firsthand. Let's start with Daniel Odom, who's out of Bellflower, California, St. John Bosco. Obviously, Notre Dame just Notre Dame has historically not been good in St. John Bosco, but Notre Dame did just get Kingston Villamuasa, obviously, after this past year. So hopefully a little bit of a pipeline starts getting built here. I know you've seen Daniel Odom in person. Your thoughts on Daniel Odom, the star receiver, 2026? Yeah, Daniel Odom is is kind of a guy that I think of like a smooth operator when I, when I think of Daniel Odom. I've seen him in, in person uh, and on the seven on uh, in game and then on the seven on seven circuit as well. Um, one of the things with, with St. John Bosco, Ryan, is that they were crazy young at wide receiver last year. Um, so this, this is kind of, uh, Daniel Odom is, has been one of the, the key pieces to this offense. Uh, and I think that his body control is something that really stands out to me. A, a crisp route runner got a great release. Um, yep. so he, he's really, I think, solidified himself. He looks like a guy who plays plays bigger than his size. I think he's listed at, at six one um, and 170 something somewhere in that ballpark. Yeah. 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 So he he's, he's going to have, you know, all those offers, especially playing at, at, at Bosco. Um, sure. But he, he's a guy that I think is really uh, on a fast track with his development and he's going to have more of those national offers as, as things move along here. But he's, I, I mean, he's probably as good as any other receiver I've seen out in the Southern California area. And, and they've got a lot of them. Marcus Harris is another one at a modern day uh, yeah. in 2025. Um, but Daniel Odom, I think, is someone that probably needs to be talked about more when you're looking at the top playmakers in SoCal. Well, funny enough is that Notre Dame, it, Daniel Odom isn't the only St. John Bosco receiver that they've offered. They've also offered Madden Williams, who 
is kind of listed as an athlete in more spots. Like he can play wide receiver. He can play defensive back. I don't know if you got eyes on too much on Madden Williams in St. John Bosco's. Cause I know you spent a lot of time looking at that school, obviously. Yeah. 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 Uh, Madden Williams is another really, really intriguing name here. Uh, and it was kind of a key piece of that young wide receiver core at St. John Bosco. He's a guy who has continued to elevate his stock. The interesting note with, uh, with, I think that's worth passing along with some of these Bosco guys uh, I went to their college showcase this past spring and um, like they, so it was Daniel Odom, Madam Williams, and I think Cameron Jones is his name. They're all the same class. Running, I think running, all running back, classes. right? Cameron Jones is running back. Uh, no? There, there is another Cameron Jones. He was the running back that committed to UCLA. Um, gotcha. But I think, I think Cameron Jones actually might be a 25 receiver. So I could be mistaken, but they all got offered at the same time. So I think that that's kind of one of the interesting aspects when you have a wide receiver coach that can go to St. John Bosco and say, I want to offer all three of you guys. Um, sure. But Madden Williams is a, is a stud, um, a guy that I think has really done a good job making the most of his opportunities, put on good weight this off season, also plays basketball for the Braves who are playing in a state title game uh, this weekend, I believe nice. in Sacramento. Um, I think Stanford and UCLA kind of have the, the hot, hot track there. Um, maybe more so Stanford. Um, and I think Penn state is another that is uh, worth keeping an eye on there. So, um, Adam Williams is, is a really talented wide out as well. Um, and someone that I think, uh, I'm going to keep an eye on moving forward. Cause he's, he's a talented player. Yeah. And a couple other guys that are on the list for Notre Dame, we're not going to break them down as much, but Trent Mosley, who is people remember Emmett Mosley for obvious reasons in the 2023 class or 2024 class wide receiver, that committed to Stan or ended up at Stanford. That is the younger brother. And he obviously his parents are both Notre Dame alumni. So we'll see if they're able to get traction with him, unlike Emmett, this uh 2024 class. Jonah Smith out of St. Santa, Santa Margarita Catholic as well. Chris Henry Jr., they have an offer too, but he's committed to Ohio State. He's now playing at Modern Day after playing in the state of Ohio the past couple years as well. So that's a Notre Dame wide receiver board. That's some early 2026 names to know. I'm going to let Max get out of here in a second because I'm going to get into a mailbag here in a second. So before I do folks though, I'm going to give Max the opportunity. Matt, Max plug everything for Twitter, YouTube, anything you want, man. Tell them where they can follow Mr. Max Torres. Yeah, no, I greatly appreciate that, Ryan. Uh, so you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at mTOR Sports, same name there, keeping it simple. Um, and then you can read my stuff over at ducksdigest.com. And then I am also on YouTube at Oregon Football Max Torres. And you can listen to me on the Ducks Dish podcast, trying to do that a little bit more often. Oregon's getting spring ball going next week. They got pro day on Tuesday, and then spring nice. ball starts Thursday and Friday, uh, Thursday and Saturday. And then they'll do a little break uh, for finals and, and spring spring break as well. So April is going to be full, full, all gas, no breaks type of deal. Um, so I'm super excited to continue covering it. And then I, I go to like a lot of the top events in SoCal. So right now I'm just planning to be at the Los Angeles Elite 11 Regional next weekend. And then also hopefully at the Under Armour camp in Los Angeles uh, at the end of the month. So you'll have a lot of top West Coast guys coming out to that one as well. And I will be bugging Max when he gets out to some of those events, obviously, because Notre Dame, especially in 2026, is gunning for a lot of California kids. So we'll see how that continues there. Max, I appreciate you, man. Thank you so much for jumping on today. We'll definitely have to have you back on soon, brother. Absolutely. Always love being here and always love talking ball. Thanks for having me, Ryan. And thanks to all the chat for, uh, for you know, engaging and having some good chat. Yes, sir. Go follow Max. We're going to hit the mailbag here next, folks. I hope you like that little bit of a crossover Notre Dame Oregon conversation before I get to the mailbag though if you could please hit that like button for me make sure you subscribe to the podcast notification bell at the bottom of the screen if you're listening to me live or if you're listening to me on one of your favorite podcast platforms whether that is Spotify Apple or anything in between five star reviews are always very much appreciated go to boards.com also for the latest rec recruiting and team intel I just put a little bit of an intel piece on Talon Taylor star receiver Geneva community in the state of Illinois 2025 has set a return visit to Notre Dame along with a couple other schools. So make sure you go to boards.ashbreakdown.com. We'll get into the mailbag here next on the Ash Breakdown podcast.
Mailbag time, folks. Again, throw your mailbag questions in the chat. I think there were a couple that just uh, popped up there. So make sure. Keep throwing those in. I'm going to get to as many mailbag questions as I possibly can until my voice gives out or I have to go pick up the daughters. One of those things are going to happen at some point. So let's get to some of the great questions. You all know it's kind of first designation when someone throws a question in the chat it goes into a into a chronological order there so if anybody wants a question that's going to throw into the beginning of the line super chats is your free that's your free pass to the front of the line but let's get into some of these questions we had link with the question link thank you so much for getting us started here man this was a very early question in the chat i believe this was yeah this was eight minutes before we even started you threw this question in so thank you so much link it says mailbag is this year going to be finally be the year where we throw consistently downfield and not be afraid to throw more than 20 yards? I'm so excited. I can't even feel my arms. Well, you can't feel your arms. That sounds like a problem. <laughs> Obviously joking. But Link, I, look, man, there's parts of me as a Notre Dame fan where I'm optimistic, but I'm very cautious with it, right? I do think, and I would say this, especially last season, I think there were a couple of reasons why Notre Dame maybe wasn't as prone for the deep portion passing game. And I also think there was parts of it where, where there was an inability to be a great deep passing team. And I think that two of the biggest reasons last year were because no matter how you feel about Sam Hartman, right? No matter how you feel about him, because I know he didn't play well in a few games, but no matter how you feel about him, the previous two years before he got to Notre Dame, he was one of the most the, the most productive deep ball throwers in all of college football. So you have to ask yourself, why did that change? Right? Like, let's ask ourselves, why did that change? Well, two reasons that I think is the biggest biggest hurdles. One was the wide receiver position was not up to snuff. Uh, the injuries happens. You may know the the chronic chronic hamstring issues that happened in the middle of the season that cost pl several players games. But I think more than that is outside of the health of the wide receivers. I just don't think there was enough juice in the offensive uh, from a wide receiver perspective. I don't think there was enough guys with true burner breakaway speed. Just don't think you had enough of it. So that's part of it. The other part is I think that the play calling was a little bit conservative last year in a lot of instances from a passing game perspective. I'm not talking about the volume of passing game, even, even though I think that Notre Dame could open it up a little bit more. I think that it was partly play calling, partly wide receiver play that held it back. I do not blame Sam Hartman for not letting it loose. Are there some throws that he could have made or could have attempted? I'm sure. But for the most part, I do think that those are probably the two things that I watched. And I said that, that was an issue last year, things that you need to figure out and you need to remedy moving forward. Now, do I think that it could be better in 2024? Yes, I do. Because I think there's a couple things that are happening for you. I do think that Sam Hartman was a good deep ball thrower at Wake Forest, but I would also say this to be very, uh, you know, to be fully transparent about it. No, Sam Hartman had a solid arm for a college quarterback. Not a great arm, though. But I do believe that Riley Leonard has a much stronger arm than Sam Hartman. I think that just naturally he can push the ball better vertically because I think he has a just more talented arm. That's one. Two, I think the wide receiver core got a lot faster this offseason. A lot faster. Whole lot. We are going to be so pumped all offseason about Chris Mitchell. And I get it, man. That kid is legit, legit fast from everything I've seen and everything I'm hearing. That's great. So you added him. Although I don't know if he'll be a, a volume getter at Notre Dame, you also added Jaden Harrison, who, if you've seen Jaden Harrison at Marshall, at least as a kick returner, guy can run for days. He is a very fast football player. You also added Cam Williams, who can run. You also have Jordan Faison, who created a couple of the bigger plays of the 2023 season, returning as a sophomore. So I think that the wide receiver crew in 2024 is just going to be more explosive and have better deep speed for one. That's what I believe. Two, I think, and I already mentioned it, I think that Riley Leonard will have the ability to push the ball vertically more easily, more efficiently, because I would say it like this, is that Riley didn't throw the ball a ton deep at Duke, but I think he came into the same issues that Notre Dame just had last year. 
just didn't have any speed out wide, man. Like Jalen Calhoun was a solid little player. Jordan Moore were solid little players, but they're not speedsters, man. They can't run like that. They're not, they're not those type of dude. They're underneath separators. So I think better arm strength, of quarterback, more explosiveness. And I think that you heard the perfect quote from Mike Denbrock yesterday in the press conference, get used to it. This is what we do after catching a deep pass. I think the play calling is going to be a lot more aggressive from a passing game perspective. A lot more, a lot more aggressive. So you add all those things together. I do believe it's going to be better link. Now there's still some cautiousness there though. There is full transparency. There is because I'm a Notre Dame fan and I have been for, for my entire life. And for the last few years, Notre Dame's speed at receiver just hasn't been good enough. Just hasn't been good enough. I think that they have the, the ingredients to be a lot better, but we have to see if the, if they're able to put it all together in 2024, I think they can. I'm optimistic that they can, but that's the cautiousness to me. Cautiousness right now for it. But I'm excited about it, Link. I'm excited about it. You said you're excited. Super excited, man. Super excited. I, I'm 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 juiced up about what this offense can be in 2024, potentially, with Mike Denbrock leading the way. We had YouTube, I always want to call them YouTube user, but it's Salty Virginia Peanuts. I still don't know why it says YouTube user instead of Salty Virginia Peanuts. It's kind of weird, but a conversation for another day, I guess, Salty. Maybe we could talk about it um, in Indianapolis at a bar sometime. I don't know. We'll, we'll, we'll figure it out. Salty said, Brian wrote, the great one has always was always the first receiver to run each drill, as well as the only wide receiver to embarrass Xavier Watts. Is there a reason for one wide receiver to lead off? I mean, typically it's a leadership thing. It's usually the veteran. It's kind of the de facto leader of the room. I actually, I did find it interesting though. I mean, like I, I saw Brian's cut up on YouTube of the wide receivers and every drill that was on there. Jaden Greathouse was leading everything. He was, I found that very interesting. Cause I just, I know Jane Thomas was banged up a little bit and, and Dion was banged up a little bit, but those guys are seniors, right? Like they're older players. And Jaden was, Notre Dame's number one receiver before he got hurt last season. Like he was their number one guy. So it was, I was curious about that one, that Jaden was not the first one in line. It was Jaden Greathouse every single time. I think that's a great sign of things to come though, man. I think that's a great sign. That means that tells me, and this is speculation on my part, that tells me that Jaden Greathouse has been putting in some work this off season. Cause obviously he has respect. Cause let's be honest. If Jaden Thomas didn't respect Jaden Greathouse, again, this is part speculation, but like part me playing football and knowing how it works. If if I had a young pup that just kept running up to the front of the line and I'm a senior and I was kind of that guy, I'd pull him back and be like, bro, like, find your spot, right? Like find your spot. I don't like that at all. But I think that that is a great sign that Jaden Greathouse, one, is working, and two, has gained the respect of his fellow wide receivers because – they wouldn't just let him jump up in front of the line if he wasn't deserving of being that guy. So I think it was a great sign because I'm a why was look, I'm really excited about Chris Mitchell. We'll talk about that uh, and we'll talk about it in nauseum. I'm excited to see Jaden Thomas fully healthy. I'm excited to see Cam Williams. But one thing that I'm most excited about probably is seeing Jaden Greathouse as a full time slot in this offense because I think that he is going to be a baller, man. Absolute baller. He was on his way. To putting together a phenomenal, phenomenal freshman year. And then obviously the injury kicked in and it kind of derailed a little bit. But regardless, I think that it's a great sign. But typically, Salty, usually guys in front of the line are the veterans, the guys that have respect, the de facto leaders. And it was interesting that Jaden is there. Now we had a super chat from Brandon Plesner. Want to throw this one out there? Brandon, thank you so much, man. I appreciate you. So what would you currently rank the 2025 Notre Dame class? What grade do you think it could potentially become? I'm at a B with the potential of an A minus. So 17 commitments in the class. Roll through it real quick. All right. Deuce Knight, a quarterback. Running backs, Daniel Anderson and Justin Thurman. Wide receivers, Elijah Burris and Sean Terry. Tight end, you have James Flanagan. Offensive line, Owen Strebig, Will Black. And who am I miss? Oh, and Matty Augustine, defensive line. You have Davion Dixon. You have Joseph Reef. You have Christopher Burgess. You have Dominic Kulak, who is a, as a hybrid player. You have Josiah Kia. You have corner. Um, you have cornerback Cree Thomas. You have safeties Ethan Long and Ivan Taylor. I think I hit everybody. That was pretty good. That was pretty good. That was just on top of my head. That was that was pretty decent. That was pretty decent. 
I would give that a very, I, I give that a B minus. Uh, sorry, I would give that a B plus, Brandon. I think that that is a very good baseline. I think that you have hit a lot of your biggest needs in the class already. But I do think that there's work to be done. So I do think that you're going to end up, I, I actually agree with your upside there. I think it's going to end up being an A minus class. I think so, potentially. Because I still think that I question, uh, like, transparency. Uh, I question the early portion of wide receiver recruiting. Question it. If you don't get Damian Shanklin, who I'll talk about later, then that's a, a loss at Viper, obviously, right? And you have to kind of figure that out. The linebacker class, I think, has eventually be very good, but there's a lot of different combinations. So there's a little bit of volatility to there, right? And then you have to close on the corners that are on the board. You have to close on them because Notre Dame is probably the Notre Dame is the leader, in my opinion, for Dallas Golden and Mark Zachary. But still got to close on it, right? Still got to finish that guy out. So I, I would say A minus. I think that there was maybe a couple questionable takes for me personally. But I do believe that Notre Dame is putting together a very, very good class, potentially. I think it's going to end up being a, a stalwart class when all is said and done. When all is said and done. Great question, Brandon. And uh, I hope the Super Chat was worth getting up to the front of the line, man. Because you made me recite the entire class off the off the cuff. I, I hope that was good, man. Hope you, hope you enjoyed. All right. Let's get now to Matt Romero said off topic. Mike Tyson versus Jake Paul. Who wins and who do you hope wins? Man, you, Matt, you know how out of touch I am with, with like the current events, I guess? I had no idea this was even a thing. No, I, I had no idea that Mike Tyson was fight, fighting Jake Paul. I think it's Jake, right? It's not Logan. I think it's Jake. I had no idea that this was happening. I, I no idea. I did look it up before we started. And I, apparently Jake is like the, the heavy betting favorites, I, I guess. Right? Um. Is this happening in, in June or July? I think it said June or July. I, you guys have to fill me in because I, I don't know enough about this. I really don't. I, I, will, I will say this from what I've seen. Jake, despite not being a, a real fighter, it kind of stays in there pretty well, it seems like. And Mike obviously is... is um, Mike is obviously a older gentleman at this point uh, obviously when he was in his prime as a heavyweight he was scary <laughs> to say the least I, I guess i'm rooting for mike tyson i i guess i i i'm definitely not rooting for for jake paul i'm, I'm definitely not rooting for jake paul so i i guess i will go with i guess i'll go with mike tyson in this conversation I, again, I saw that Paul was the clear favorites to the, be the winner. So I guess that it's the age thing, I suppose. But uh, I'll, I'll take Mike Tyson. If I have to pick one, I'll, I'll be rooting for Mike Tyson, I suppose. I suppose. <laughs> uh, so so many weird questions, man. I And truly, Matt, thank you for bringing that up because I had no idea that was even a thing. Zero. I, like, I literally read it and I was like, Tyson versus Paul. I'm like, who the heck is Tyson? Like, Paul, I assumed that it was, you know, Jake Paul. Like, I, like my mind went there, right? But I was like, who's Tyson? Like, Tyson, I'm like, I, I, I literally didn't know who it was at first. So, yeah, we'll see, man. We'll see. It's going to be on Netflix. Okay, well, like, maybe I'll watch it then if it's on Netflix. Maybe I'll watch it then. We had Salty Virginia Peanuts, or actually, I'm going to start calling you YouTube user because I think it would be funny. So uh, YouTube user says, any recruiting update on the DeLorean? Oh, that's hilarious. Salty, that's really good, man. That's great. Of course, he's talking about Antoine Delorier, the linebacker out of Raven Gap, the Coochie School in Georgia. 6'1", 225, originally from Canada, has been blown up on the recruiting trail. Uh, the only update I can give you, Salty, is one is that he has two visits set up. He has an unofficial and, a, and an official visit already set to Notre Dame. I think Notre Dame is in a great early spot. And we have gotten some insight that he is absolutely a take for Notre Dame. So I know that people always ask that question, like, is he definitely a take? Yes. there's a. It's a big linebacker board of guys that I would say are takes, right, for sure. But Antoine Delorier is a take for Notre Dame, and I believe that Notre Dame is in a good spot with him. We'll see how the visits go. That'll ultimately determine everything, but I I like Notre Dame's chances in that one in the end. I like Notre Dame's chances in the end on that one. All right. Good question, though, Salty. I'll get back. To, uh, sorry, YouTube user. Great question. Great question, YouTube user. 
We had Lucky Ducks. says, how would you rank Ryder Lions, Brady Smigel, Brady Hart, and Noah, Noah Grubbs? And how would you rank their interest level in Notre Dame? All right, so ranking them as players. This is personal preference, Lucky Ducks. Like I, Again, transparency. I prefer dual threat. I do. Guys that can do both. Guys, guys that can affect the game with their legs. As a defensive-minded guy, typically – there's no bigger headache than a guy that can kill you with his legs as a quarterback. Cause my impulse is always, I would love to play man coverage. Like I'm going to mix in zone and, and different combo coverages at times, but like, I would love to run man if I can, cause that means I can be more creative in my front seven, as far as blitz looks and different alignments. Like that is the ideal scenario, but ultimately, so ultimately I do have a bias towards athletic quarterbacks. I just kind of want to put that in the universe before I answer this question, just so you all understand. So for me, out of those four, I would go Ryder Lions one. Number two, actually, you have it in order. Actually, for me, <laughs> I, was, I was really working the list. I'm like, you have it. So Ryder Lions one, dual threat ability. I think he's got tremendous upside as a dual threat quarterback. Brady Sme- uh, Smigel, not a dynamic athlete, but he moves well in the pocket, and he's a great pocket passer. Brady Hart, similar ish to Brady Smigel as far as skill set, except I think he's actually a little bit more athletic than what he is. But Smigel, I think, is just a more high upside quarterback as far as the the just the throwing ability. And then no, no, Noah Grubbs would be four for me, but I want that to be understood that that is an awesome four man quarterback conversation right there. If Notre Dame ended up with Noah Grubbs, would not be upset one little bit, like zero. And that compares to like 2025. Let's talk, for instance. I remember like some of the early quarterbacks on the board were George McIntyre and Deuce Knight and Antoine Hill and Cutter Bowley before he he reclassified. And in that class, there were a couple quarterbacks on the board that I would not have been pumped up about if it was Notre Dame. Like if, if Notre Dame would have got Cutter Bowley and he would stay 2025, I wouldn't have been juiced. Like I like Cutter, but like he's not as good as some of those other guys. That that conversation though, like I'd be completely fine if Notre Dame got Noah Grubbs totally fine i'd be happy with that but if they got any of those four quarterbacks i would be pretty happy i'd be pretty happy but i would go lions smigel hart and grubs as far as their interest level the great part is that that group is all pretty much interesting all pretty interesting Notre Dame. i would actually say interest level i would go noah grubs one because i think he really likes notre dame i do two rider lions also really likes notre dame Brady Smigel three would be for me because I think that he is high in Notre Dame, but there's still a lot to figure out there. And then I would say Brady Hart is four right now. Now, Brady likes Notre Dame. He literally has a visit set up for Notre Dame, and this could completely change after the visit. But as of today, that's how I would have it. I would have it Grubs, Lions, Hart, um, sorry, Grubs, Lions, Smigel, Hearts would be how I would go as far as their general interest level today. Today. Salty, or sorry, <laughs> keep calling you by YouTube user. YouTube user asks, any updates on Taylor Taylor, the star receiver 2025 out of Geneva Community in Geneva, Illinois? Salty, you're on the message board, dog. Like, I literally had an intel piece about this. He's he's going to be visiting in April on an unofficial visit. There's also talk about him setting up an official visit to Notre Dame as well, which is probably expected. I would say right now, top four schools and no apparent or uh, no uh, no real order here right now. Georgia, Notre Dame, Ohio State, Michigan. Those are the four, I think, right now for Taylor and Taylor. I think Notre Dame has a chance. It's just about how the next couple months go, man. You really got to th- keep developing that relationship with Mike Brown, who's got a good relationship with now. Come out, fire. Or like when you get him on campus and he's getting see the court, the offense moving a little bit. Hopefully, Riley Leonard in that wide receiver room is putting on a little bit of a show. Like, just keep at it, man. Just keep at it, and we'll see what happens in the end. We'll see what happens. Thank you, YouTube user, as always. All right. Oh, man, I, I'm so – Mile High Pride 94. I'm so sorry. I missed this question. This was supposed to be for, for me and Max when he was still on. My my deepest apologies. We said question for both of you. Make a prediction. How many commits will your school have by the spring game? So I will just make that – I will make that prediction then. I will say Notre Dame will have – by the spring game, by the spring game. I, I would say Notre Dame will have 19. Uh, I'll say Notre Dame has. It's a good question. I'd say Notre Dame will have 19 or 20 commits by the spring game. That's my prediction. 19 or 20 commits by the spring game. That that will be my prediction. And then the spring game will be a nice 
bump, you know, a couple other guys that might silently commit during that weekend, like that type of thing. So that'll be my guess as of today. Good question to my high. And I'm sorry that Max wasn't on when I answered that question. My apologies. All right. Let's go to our next one. All right. A lot of great questions today, man. A lot of great questions. A lot of great questions. You guys are being so nice in the chat today, too. I don't have to put anybody in timeout or anything while I'm uh, while I'm navigating getting questions and not getting questions. So, all right, let's go to Andy Milton fans. In general, what are your thoughts on 2025 recruiting commits and board? I, I, I talked about this a little bit with Brandon's uh, Milton, but um, – I think that Notre Dame is in a great, a great spot, man. Like, again, I think, I think it's a B plus right now. I think it can get into an a minus range. Love the quarterback running back. Running back's good for Notre Dame. I think that you maybe you were a little quick on, on the running back situation in 2025, a little bit, but I still like the, the two man hall that they have. I mean, Justin Thurman brings a lot of speed to the table. I'm, I'm just upset that Daniel Anderson wasn't able to stay healthy as a junior, because I think he could end up having a big year that would kind of change the perception of him a little bit. Wide receiver recruiting, I have a lot of question marks right now. Tight end, I think you've got a stud in James Flanagan. Offensive line recruiting is in a great place. Defensive line recruiting, I have I, I have a question mark at Viper, and I hope I really hope that they push for Javion Campbell. Like I really hope that they do that. Linebacker recruiting, you only have one true linebacker in the class right now, but I think the I think the Notre Dame linebacker class is going to end up being really good in 2025. I truly do cornerback as long as you close on mark zachary and dallas golden i think that's an elite class and safety you're in a great spot already and if you get Jadon blair to come aboard and that is an elite elite safety class so i really like the class overall are there a couple of things that i wish were a little bit different or maybe a guy that you push for early or a guy that you kind of not slow played but just like kind of let things happen a little bit i i i think that that would be a very interesting one you know, uh, kind of interesting proposition, but ultimately I think that Notre Dame is going to end up having a great, great class, uh, great class in 2025. All right, let's go now. Let's go back to YouTube user. Great guy, that YouTube user, man. Promise you any recruiting updates on Damien six, six, six Shanklin. Is he trending away from the Irish? Look, someone talked about this on the board a little bit. This is how I would portray the Damian Shanklin recruitment. I think Notre Dame was the leader. But I have always told you guys, the minute Ohio State throws their hat into the ring, it's going to be a very tough battle. So does no, is Notre Dame still in it for Damian Shanklin? He's the defensive end out of Indianapolis, Indiana, Warren Central, by the way. Yeah, they're in it. I would say that they're again, it's going to end up being a Notre Dame-Ohio State battle, in my opinion. I think it is. I would just kind of portray it as this YouTube user. Great guy, by the way, that YouTube user. I, I would just phrase it as this. I think it was Notre Dame's to lose if Ohio State never offered. I think that now Notre Dame is going to have to battle. So I wouldn't say it's trending away because Notre Dame still has a chance there. Like they still have a very good chance there. It's just now you have to stop the momentum from Ohio State's side because obviously Ohio State's recruiting at a very good level in 2025. Damian Shanklin, that was a school that he has liked for a while and was just waiting on the offer. So. It's going to be a tougher battle, but I don't think it's over with. You just have to convince that Notre Dame is the place to be. And, and you had to do that with Christopher Burgess already. Like Christopher Burgess, there was a time where there was a time where it didn't seem like Christopher Burgess maybe was going to end up at Notre Dame. Like literally there was, you know, Michigan was in the conversation, Ohio State, and and, and Notre Dame was able to prove it in the end and be able to, to close on Christopher Burgess. So it's definitely not over, man. Definitely not over. I think Notre Dame still has a chance to to finish that one out. It's just it's going to be tougher now. Is kind of the thing with Ohio State. I think if Ohio State never never, I think if Ohio State never offered Damian Shanklin, it would have been almost clear sailing. As long as you just keep doing what you're doing, you probably end up with Damian Shanklin. Now you need to fight. You need you need to fight very hard for Damian Shanklin, which I think Notre Dame can. I think they can, but we will we will see. All right, so let's go now. Uh, Andy Melton fans says, if you were in BK's shoes, what would you have done to keep MB? Oh, um, do you think it realizes that he lost? Who is MB? Am I talking about Mike Dembrock? Is, is that who we're talking about, Nathan? Uh, real quick in the chat, man. If you could just send me a, yes, it's Mike Dembrock. Is, is that who we're talking about right now? 
for Brian Kelly. Hopefully he answers here in a, in a second, so I don't have to keep stalling. <laughs> yes, Stenbrock. Okay, got it. MB, MB crossed me up a little bit. Um, I, I don't... Look, I I don't know as much about the backstory that that Brian was talking about as far as like how everything kind of went down. I know that he put a, an intel piece on the message board. I would just say I would just say this about the whole situation. I think that this I I think Mike Denbrock wanted to get back to the Midwest, right? That's where his family's from and so I I don't know if it was necessarily something that Brian Kelly could have done differently. It's just it's fortunate that he wasn't able to make it make it happen, right? I I, I I just don't know if there was anything I would necessarily say he could have done differently. I know we can we can throw shade at BK all we want, and I do it all the time, right? Like I, I just I just and I'll call out his faults if I think he did something wrong or if I think he could have done something differently. But I, I think that that one was more Mike Denbrock is wants to be back closer to family. He loved being at Notre Dame. I, I just I just think that it was a good fit for him. So I, I don't necessarily think it was a, I don't think it was a Brian Kelly fault thing. I, I think it was just more Notre Dame was an attractive place for Mike Denbrock currently. So, yeah. We had a question, Jason Smith. How, how does recruiting 2026 quarterback look, look line, uh, Brady, um, <laughs> Brady lines, Ryder Lions, Brady Smeagol, Smeagol, excuse me, Brady Hart's, Noah Grubbs, Troy Hewn. Uh, just some quick updates, Jason. I know I hit on those guys a little bit. I'll just kind of do a quick latest because I know people want information out there, obviously. Ryder Lions, I expect him to, to visit sometime this offseason. They're in a good spot with him. I think that he's heavily interested in Notre Dame. He has a great relationship with Gino Gadulli, which is great. We just saw what the, how, how well that could pay off in the 2024 class, 2025 class excuse me, with Deuce Knight. So I think that you're in a good spot there. Brady Smigel, I think that you really blew him away with the visit. I think of getting him back on campus is going to be huge, but he aligns with your va core values as a Notre Dame football player. He wants to play big-time football. He wants to play under a really good offensive coordinator. Obviously, you have that now with Mike Denbrock, and he's a very religious guy. So I think that, that would align potentially. Again, just get him back on campus and keep chopping away at that one. Brady Hart, it's kind of to be determined right now. He Good early impressions of Notre Dame, but – He's going to be on campus this off season. So get him on campus, see how that fit makes sense. See if it's a place he likes, see if Notre Dame's going to push for him. There's just some things to figure out about Brady Hart. Noah Grubbs, this will be his third trip to campus. He has one coming up this off season as well. So it'll be his third overall trip. I think he really likes Notre Dame. I think Notre Dame likes Noah Grubbs as well. It's just about if he is the guy in the end that you push heavily for. And Troy Hewn is just a little bit early to figure out as well. It's a, kind of a to be determined one. He's never been on campus. Notre Dame's been out to see him during the open period, which is great, but just kind of seeing how that fit makes sense potentially. So that's kind of the quick, the quick little, uh, quick little tidbits, I guess, on the quarterback class for 2026 20, for Notre Dame. All right. <laughs> oh man. Uh, Deuce went, Deuce went, uh, Deuce went live on Instagram. It's time to close the show. That's fine with me, man. I can go. I can go get some work done, Brandon. I don't have to do the show, man. Obviously kidding. Obviously kidding. All right, let's go to YouTube user. <laughs> Great guy, that YouTube user, by the way. Do you remain most confident that? Um, sorry, uh, Dallas Golden and Mark Zachary will commit to the Irish. I believe that Notre Dame is the leader for Mark Zachary and Dallas Golden. Yes, I would say that. I think that the intention, at least today, is for Dallas Golden to take his official visits and make a decision sometime this off season, right? A little bit later in the off season. We'll see if that changes. I mean, it could always change, but yes, I believe that they are the leader for Dallas golden. And I ve feel very good about where they are with Mark Zachary. I think that that's one that could probably end a little bit sooner than Dallas is, is kind of where I'm at right now. And I think that Notre Dame is the perceived leader. Michigan's the other big player for Mark Zachary, but Coach Clink Scales, their former secondary coach at Michigan, left this offseason for the Los Angeles Chargers as well, and I think that was a big domino in that recruitment. So, yeah, I think Notre Dame is in a very good spot with both players right now. All right, let me get through a few of these questions here. Bum, 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 bum. All right, so let's go to this one. We had the Trek reviewer says, 
Where do you think Audric Estime will end up? I would like it to be Buffalo because they need a back that is a good blocker and a short yardage back to take some of the pressure off of Josh Allen. It's a great question. So a couple of those teams that I know had talked to him because I was in Indianapolis and I and he was asked of him a couple couple teams that had been uh, that he had formal visits with. So actually he had a formal visit with the Buffalo Bills. That was one. And it would be a good spot, I, I think, with uh, James Cook, who's a little bit more of your, your space-oriented runner. I think that Audric would be a decent fit there. He mentioned the the San Francisco 49ers were a team that had talked to him a ton recently. The Baltimore Ravens was a team that had him for a formal, formal interview. And I'm told this, though. I, I will give you a little bit of insight, I guess, is that the Cleveland Browns like Audric a lot. So Cleveland Browns, I think, are a huge contender. But I really, I like him in Baltimore, man. I think that he would just be so dynamic as a downhill inside zone runner with Lamar Jackson. Like that would be dumb. <laughs> like, that would be so stupid. So I'll go Baltimore. Although I think Cleveland and a couple other teams are high contenders. But I guess I'll I'll, I'll predict that he's he's in the AFC North. Okay, does, does that work? I'll predict he's AFC, AFC North. Whether it's Cleveland or Baltimore, I say that he ends up in one of those teams. That's my prediction. My prediction. All right, let's see. Let's see how many more we got here. <laughs> no, not the Browns. Yeah, Pittsburgh would be. I, I see someone say Pittsburgh. I, they have Najee Harris already. Who kind of handles a lot of the short yardage stuff. I don't, I don't. Oh, Dallas was another one. By the way, I just, I just remembered. Dallas Cowboys were another team that had a formal visit with Audric as well. He would be a very interesting compliment to. Tony Pollard, because Tony Pollard is kind of also a space-oriented player, similar to, to James Cook. So that would be a very interesting pairing, potentially, there. All right. Uh, M- Michael, Dallas fan in DC1 Campbell. I didn't read this beforehand, so let's see what you let's see what you got, Michael. I'm not moving off of Freeman's 2024 recruiting class that I have underrated and ranked across the top four recruiting services because none or minimum the number five or number six class. When do you, we regrade it? When do we regrade it? Well, I mean, we can do a quick regrade after the first season, Michael, I think that you can do that positively, but I think for it, it's like an NFL draft landscape a little bit. It takes a couple of years to really truly understand if you hit or missed on a team, right. Or on a class, or if you truly hit or miss on a player in general. So I would say we can do a, a, a quick regrade after the first season to see how everything is trending. But I think it's going to take two to three years to truly understand if you hit on a class or not. It's going to take a little bit, but great question. All right. We got Archer 452 says in the college football playoff era, who are the best Notre Dame players at the following positions? Quarterback, running back, wide receiver. So when did college football playoff begin? I'm trying to remember the exact year college football playoff. And if someone knows in the chat when the college football playoff, when the first season was of the college football playoff, that was, what was that? 2000. I'm trying to remember 2014. Thank you, Archer. I appreciate you, man. 2014. Okay. So since 2014, best player at quarterback running back and wide receiver for Notre Dame. Wide receiver will be Will Fuller for me. Wide receiver will be Will Fuller. Oh, yeah, Archer True. You do remember that well, don't you? <laughs> That's funny. Wide receiver, Will Fuller. Running back would be Audrick Estime for me. Kyron has a conversation, but I would go with Audrick Estime for his, what he just did this past season. And then quarterback. Quarterback. Let me think. Deshaun Kaiser, I guess, his, for his one year, one really good year was in the conversation. Ian Book. Oh, God. <laughs> Quarterback's not been the best. <laughs> it's not been the best. Audrey guess the main running back, Will Fuller, and I'll go with the Sean Kaiser for his 2015 season, I guess. Not in the entirety, but I'll go with the I'll go with the Sean in 2015, I suppose. I mean, he's definitely probably the most talented quarterback, if nothing else, they've had, right? I mean, you wish that the personal side was a little bit better as far as his really want to be great and that type of stuff, but yeah, I guess I'll go with Deshaun Kaiser for the one year. Because the only other option really is Ian Book, I guess, right? I mean, yeah, man. Oh, hopefully we're having a much different conversation about quarterbacks soon here. But wide receiver, Will Fuller, running back, Audrey Gustaman. I feel good about those answers at least. Ugh, yuck. 
All right. Yes, and Archer, I, I know you. I know you remember 2014, man. I got you. I got you, brother. I got you. Totally forgot about that. Jack Cohn. Eh, Jack was good. Jack was good for his lone year, but I mean, I don't know, man. I, I this is where I, I mean, I, I respect what Jack Cohn did because I do think that he got too much blame for a lot of things, but there's still deficiencies in Jack Cohn, right? Like there's there's still some stuff where it's just like, all right, Cohn's fine. He's fine. He's a he's a good good college quarterback, Jack Cohn. Good college quarterback. B feeder with a question. Ryan, not sure if you collect sports memorabilia. I don't anymore. I used to do the trading card stuff back in the day. If so, how much game used memorabilia did you collect from your trip to the underwear Olympics? I did not collect anything from my trip to my underwear Olympics. I suppose I have my my media credential, you know, the the badge that I wore. I, I guess that was my uh if that counts as memorabilia, I don't know. But I was a big trading card fan back in the day. Like I used to, I used to be big on cards when I was younger. I, I don't do any of that stuff anymore. I used to be a big um, jersey guy as well. I used to like to um, to get some throwbacks, like a Jack Young blood. My got my dad an AJ Dewey jersey that played with the Dolphins. I actually got him a signed Manny Fernandez jersey that played with the Dolphins in the seventies as well during their couple magical super bowl runs there in 72 and 73 so i was a jersey guy i was a trading card guy but otherwise i haven't collected anything in a long time a long time but if my media credential counts i suppose that would be it otherwise receipts i guess receipts from the from the uh from the spot but yeah yeah all right i think we got two more left not new uh, Brendan, I mean, I got some New Jersey's occasionally. Like, I'm a Rams fan, so like, I have I have like an Aaron Donald jersey, and like, you know, I've I've had like a Marshall Falk jersey growing up. But I, I I'm you know I I was a big fan of certain players growing up a lot, so I would just collect jerseys like, I, and I would do throwbacks a lot. But I mean, I had like a, a Damian Tomlinson growing up. I had I had Luke Keekley. I was a big Luke Keekley fan growing up. So yeah. I like to I like to commemorate great players, man. I like to really remember commemorate great players. So yeah. We had Joe Allen with the question who says, Is there anyone that hasn't committed yet that could fall off the list if Notre Dame gets another commitment? That could fall off the list. Oh, so you're saying uh, I, I think I understand what you're saying. So Joe, I, I believe you're asking me if another guy commits that guys that are in contention that could, you know, not have a place in the class anymore is kind of how you're how you're phrasing it. Um I mean, wide receiver is going to be interesting. Notre Dame gets another two commit. Uh, so let, let's say if Notre Dame gets, let's just hypothetical, they say they get Derek Meadows and they get another receiver in the class, whether it's like Raiden Bynes Bright or something. That technically could be the end of wide receiver recruiting. I think they would still recruit Taylor and Taylor, but I'm not 100% sure on that. I mean, that's just speculation on my part. Offensive line, we may have already seen it. I mean, there's a possibility that they push to four and they get Jack Lang if they if they really push hard, but I mean, you may have already seen that at offensive line as far as there just not being another spot left. Defensive line wise, I, I think that it's I think it's coming down to you want Damian Shanklin and Viper. Are you gonna add one more in a Javion Campbell type of player? I think that's on the table. Linebacker could be that type of situation because I, I think there's a possibility that Notre Dame could go for four linebackers in the class, but it depends what four it is. Like I would I, I think if if a couple particular linebackers end up committing Notre Dame. I think Notre Dame could cut it at three if it's the right three type of situation. So there might be a guy that's left left on the out, outlook. So, yeah, hopefully that answers the question. I know it wasn't the best answer, but it's kind of how it's. All right. I think we're running down to the end here. Let's see. Archer said, Ohio State just got a commitment from a 2024 Aussie punter who is six foot seven, 255 pounds. How big is too big for a punter? That's a um, how big is too big for a punter? Um, I don't know if there's too big for a punter. I mean, there there's a point where if you're too bulky, you lose flexibility. And punting's a big thing about about flexibility, right? Like a flexible leg. You know, you you see the picture of guys after they're after they kick and they're on their follow through their legs super high in the air. So I think there's tightness that could happen if you get too big, but for the most part, I don't know if there's necessarily a number on it. Like I've seen some chunky, chunky punters, man. I see some chunky punters and kickers in the past. So I don't know if there's necessarily a, 
I don't know if there's necessarily a bad one, but I would say Archer, I, I saw this kid punts and he is not too bulky. I don't think like he's just a big kid, man. Like he's a big physically impressive punter out of Australia. So I think that's going to end it for us today though, folks I want to appreciate you all so much here and send a shout out. You guys were fantastic and I really appreciate all the great questions. Hope you guys truly like the conversation I had with Max Torres earlier as well. Before we get out of here, if you could please just for me, Hit that like button, subscribe to the podcast, hit the notification bell. If you can go on any of your favorite podcast platforms, whether that is Apple Podcasts, whether that is Spotify, anything, and you give me a five-star review and in the comments say, like, Ryan's awesome, man. Ryan is such a cool dude. Really, really like Ryan. So that would be great. And also go to boardsidersbreakdown.com. Thank you all those so much. I really appreciate you for joining the Notre Dame Recruiting Hour today. We'll talk to you again very soon here on the Irish Breakdown Podcast.